Turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 8 this morning. Actually, what I'd like to do if you have your Bible, turn first to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to focus on two different scriptures today. But if you put your thumb at Matthew chapter 14, so I'll give you a second to do that. Matthew chapter 14. And then flip over to Luke chapter 8. We're going to read Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I want to talk to you today about the power of one. The power that we have as believers. I want to encourage you today about what God has called you to be. So Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 38. And we're going to read verse 30 and 39. It says this. It says, The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. And who he's begging is Jesus. Jesus is getting ready to leave. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged him to go with him. But Jesus said to this man that was formerly called Legion. We know, let's call him Bob today or something, okay? Is Bob a good name for him? We don't know what his name was. But he's not Legion anymore because all those demons are gone, right? Yeah. So... So the man from whom the, the demons had gone out begged him, but Jesus sent him away saying this, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you would touch our, our hearts today, that you would touch our minds. Lord, that we'd be attentive to your word. And Lord, I pray that today not only would we hear, but Holy Spirit, that you would help us to take action. That you'd show us areas of our life where we could be changed, where we could take action, where we could be like you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to I want you to be able to walk away from here this morning knowing that you can make a difference. Now, there, there's a difference in, in me saying that because you can walk away from here knowing that your church can make a difference. We talk about that a lot of times. But, but that's kind of an out for us, isn't it? I mean, it is to me. We want the church to make a difference. But today's a little bit different. Today, I want to focus on you as a part of this church. You can make a difference. One person, you, working together in conjunction with the person sitting next to you, can make a huge difference, not only in Yankton, but for this entire region for Christ. And the reason is, is that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. God has a reason and a purpose for you. And that reason and purpose is higher than just showing up here on Sundays and sitting in a pew or a chair. He's got something for you to do. You being here is amazing. Don't stop doing that because that's a part of it. But he's got something for you to do. Our text today is from a story that most of us have heard many times. It's, a, it's an amazing story. So, and, and, and I'll just kind of tell you the story and you can read in it. You can read through it in Luke chapter 8 and kind of see this. But, but, but Jesus and his disciples get into a boat. And what they're deciding to do, and, and we don't have the upfront story, so I'm going to just read into it a little bit. So you guys hang in there with me, okay? So we know some of this from history, but, and we can kind of guess it by how people operate. So not all of this is in Scripture, so I'm just going to stay up front. So I'm going to tell you a story based around the Scripture, okay? You guys understand what I'm doing? So, so don't say, well, Pastor said that this happened. Because I'll let you know if I'm telling you a story or not. So some of it's a story. So, so basically, this is what we know. Jesus' and disciples get into a boat, and they're sailing across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, to an area called the Ten Cities. Now, we know this, and, and that's the region where the Scripture says with the Gesserines. Now, history tells us that this was the rough side of Israel. In fact, you can kind of compare it to... Chicago or something like that. How, how many know that Chicago is not a great place to be? There's like hundreds of murders every year in Chicago, right? 
Now, there's a beautiful side of Chicago, which is an amazing place. There's beautiful parks. But if I told you today that you needed to go live in Hyde Park, and you don't know what that is, I would look into it. <laughs> because it is a rough part of town. It's a dangerous neighborhood. Hyde Park, you hear that on the news sometimes. Edgewater, Jefferson Park. Don't they sound like beautiful names? <laughs> but boy, is it a rough area of town. Some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the entire country. Now, if your goal is to feel what to, 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 to be able to feel what it's like to get shot with a bullet, then you should go there. <laughs> It would be pretty cool because chances are, higher than any place else in the nation, you would get that. Now, the Ten Cities region in Israel was known for its demonic acti activity. They, they knew it. Across Israel, they knew what was going on. We know this from history. And that Ten Cities region in Israel was a place where, well, let's just say it, it's not a place where the good people of Yankton Assembly would, would go. Unless, of course, you're on a missions trip, right? That, that's when we go to places like this. So, so again, Scripture doesn't say this, but I'm assuming that Jesus is taking his disciples on a mission trip. <laughs> and they're climbing into a boat, and they know where they're going. So they get in the boat, they head out on this mission trip to the high park of Israel, and guess what happens? A storm brews. A storm comes and they're blowing and the disciples are struggling against the waves and, and Jesus is, is in the bow of the boat asleep. And the storm is blowing and the boat's filling with water and the disciples are starting to freak out and they finally get so concerned with it they can't believe that Jesus is in the way. That guy's a hard sleeper. <laughs> And, and they finally go wake up Jesus, and Jesus stands up and he simply rebukes the wind and the waves, and the sea becomes calm. That's what scripture says that, that happened. But you, can you imagine? I mean, put yourself in one of the disciples' shoes. You pick it, there's 12 of them out there. Pick which one. Put yourself in their shoes. You know where you're going. You're on a mission trip. You know about the demonic activity that's happening there. Do you think you'd be thinking, wow, this is kind of weird? Spiritual warfare, maybe? Is this, this is a little scary. What are we going to encounter? And so they have all these things going on in their lives. And, 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 and many times when we read this in the Bible, we read it without emotion. But the, the disciples were terrified and amazed at the same time. In fact, they say this. They say, who is this man that even the wind and waves obey him? Put yourself in, in their shoes. What would you be saying to each other? How many remember the Twilight Zone? <laughs> kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Do, 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 do. You know, that, that kind of stuff. What a crazy day. But the craziness had just started. Jesus and his disciples make landfall at Gerasenes, and they stand up to get out of the boat, and they begin to hear screams. Don't you love mission trips like that? <laughs> And all of a sudden, a naked, crazy man comes running towards them, screaming. And Jesus starts commanding the demons to come out of the man. Just a normal day in the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus sends the disciples, or not the disciples, <laughs> Jesus sends the demons into a herd of pigs. And the pigs plunge down the hillside and drown. That's the first ever recorded instance of suicide. <laughs> well, thank you, don't joke, but I like that. And then we get to our text today. The man that used to be called Legion begged Jesus to let him come with him. You heard it. Lord, let me come with you. And Jesus said, no. He says, you should stay in garrisons in that region and tell everyone Tell everybody, tell your family, tell them all about the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, the people of Gerasenes had never heard of Jesus. In fact, if you continue reading the story, what Jesus did with Legion scared them so much that they came to Jesus and the disciples and they said, would you please leave? We need you out of our region. 
they were freaking out because this guy that they couldn't chain down, Jesus had set him free, and they weren't just lost a herd of pigs. First off, what are a bunch of Jews doing with pigs around them? That's a meat they're not supposed to eat. Why are they raising a herd of pigs? You know that's what's going on in that, that, that part of the town there. And they're so afraid, so they said, Jesus, get out of here. So Jesus and the disciples get back in the boat, and they head back to the other side of the lake. But the man who used to be called Jesus, Legion, the man now called Bob, the Bible doesn't say that. We're just calling him Bob today, right? So kind of mentioned, what about Bob? You know, good movie thing to be honest with you. Stays and starts to do what Jesus told him to do. He stays and he begins to tell people about the power of Jesus, the Son of God. A while later in Scripture, Jesus decides to make another trip to the ten cities region. Flip, flip over to Matthew chapter 14. And now let's take a look at what the Scripture says here. Another story, Matthew chapter 14. Get over there, we're going to begin in verse 34. It's up here. And when they crossed over, they landed in Gerasim. So it's a ten cities region. This is another city in that region. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus... Whoa, we just, something happened, something changed. I mean, he was just there just a little bit earlier. Nobody knew anything about Jesus, and they told him to leave. Something changed. Something happened. They recognized Jesus, and they sent word to all of the surrounding country, and the people brought all their sick to him, and he begged them to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. healed. So Jesus and his disciples returned to this region where Jesus had set that man, of Bob, free of all these legion of demons, and the people are no longer afraid of Jesus. They're no longer begging Jesus to leave. Instead, they recognize Jesus, and they begin to come to Him for healing. What made the difference? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell you. But I'm going to tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I think changed. I think Bob made a difference. The only change that we record in Scripture, or even in history that we see, the only difference is that Jesus had set Bob free. It's okay if I use Bob. <laughs> Jesus had set him free, told him to go out and minister to the people in the region. He comes back later, and everybody knows who Jesus is. The power of one person touched by Jesus. When you're obedient to what Christ has for you, you can be like Bob. He went and changed an entire region for Christ to a point that the people even recognized Jesus and came running to Him. Let me tell you this morning that if God can take a man that was running around naked, out of his mind, and demon possessed, and used him to change an entire region for Christ, I think He can do the same thing with me and you. I think you can. Because it is possible for one person to make a difference. It is possible. And that one person isn't sitting next to you. That one person is you. He can use you to make a difference. You can make a difference at your work. I don't care how bad your work is or how well it is. You can make a difference. You can make a difference in your friends and family. I don't care if they're not believers or not. You can make a difference. You can make a difference in your neighborhood. And the same God that used God can use you too. The question becomes, will I allow the Lord to use me, not can the Lord use me? Let me repeat that because that's pretty good because I should have heard like 18 amens there. The question is, will you allow the Lord to use you? Not can the Lord use you? See, God has a plan for you. And He will use you to make a difference in this world. Your vision may be small. You may not know what that looks like. You may not even know that you can do anything. You may see all of the problems that are going on inside of you. What God sees is a redeemed you. 
What God sees is somebody that He wants to empower to do amazing things for the kingdom of God. He has a plan for you. And He'll use you to make a difference in this world. Amen? Amen. You see, God will use you to touch this world if you'll just give Him what you have and allow Him to use you. Let's take a look at, a, at an example of that. And it's in John chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, and, and in verse 11 as well. And it's up here on the screen if you want to take a look at it there. Our first point. And I'm not going to read it to you because we know the story well. You can just read it for yourself. But there are 5,000 men and, and, and even more women and children in the crowd. In those days, they usually just counted the men, not all the, the other folks are around them. And, 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 and what could a couple of fish and, 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 and loaves of bread to a, do for a large crowd like that? But you see, with God, all things are possible. And if we'll simply surrender our all to Him, He'll use what we have, whether it be stinky fish and a few loaves of bread, whether it be a couple of bottles of water, which I'm going to take a drink of right now. Excuse me. Whatever that you have, you may see that there's no value in it, but whatever God has given you, whatever He's provided for you, the skills that you have, the talents that you have, the blessings that He's poured out upon you, God can use all these things. Because with God, all things are possible. And all we have to do is simply surrender our all to Him. And He'll use what we have. And not only will we just use it, but when we surrender it to Him, God does something amazing. He multiplies it. He multiplies your talent. He uses you in ways that you have no idea that you, you even had those talents. And as you begin to step out into the goodness of God, a simple gesture turns into something that will feed thousands. And a multitude of people will be touched just like they were here with the fish and loaves by the miracle working power of God. Christ. God can use you if you allow Him to use you. So what is it today that you're hanging on to? What is it today that you're afraid to surrender to God? What talents are you saying are just not talents because you're just not talented enough? What is it today that you have that you can give to the King of Kings so that He can multiply it and touch a world for Christ? What is it today that you've sensed the Holy Spirit asking you to step out into and do, but you've been afraid to do it because you just don't feel like you have the skill? What is it today? What is it today that you feel you just can't give up because you don't know the end? What is it? And if you'll step out, if you'll put the fear aside and allow God to use you, God will bless it and He'll multiply it and amazing things will happen through your life to touch a generation of people. Because that's what the kingdom is all about. It's about touching this world for Christ. Amen? Won't you allow Him to use you to touch this world for Christ? Allow Him to use you by simply giving it to God and taking the step of faith. Amen? Amen. See, God can use you to touch this world if you'll just step out in obedience even when it doesn't make sense. This is number two. There's always three parts to a good sermon, I see, right? <laughs> Sometimes I have like eight parts. So five of those parts are really good, but there's three of them that are okay. But God can use you to touch this world if you just step out in obedience even when it doesn't make sense. Let's take an example of, uh, with, with Noah in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, and it says this, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah commended or condemned the rest of the world to receive the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, God told Noah to build a great big boat because he was going to flood the earth. And you know what Noah said? He said, what's a boat? Because it had never rained. 
Rain had not happened yet. In, in those days, the water came up from the ground and everything was watered that way. It hadn't happened. And, and, and so Noah is, is getting this, hearing this thing from the Lord and, 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 and God's speaking to him about building an ark and, and Noah doesn't even know what it is. But he steps out of obedience. I don't think he understood it at all. I think he's gone, okay, you know, I got the dimensions, I'm going to build this thing. I have no vision for what that is. You know, imagine not even having any clue of what something is and just being told to go build it. I mean, that takes incredible faith. I don't think he had any understanding at all other than what God told him in Scripture. Here's the dimension. You're going to build an ark, and this is what's going to happen. One thing that Noah did know is how to hear the voice of God. And I would rather be able to hear the voice of God and act in obedience and have understanding to be able to go, go do something that I already understand. Amen. He knew how to hear the voice of God. And he made a decision to do what God is leading him to do in spite of his understanding. And Noah begins building a boat. And I can imagine people were probably making fun of him. Again, this is one of those things. I mean, people were jeering him and talks about it. But I can imagine they were making fun of him. The neighbors were probably yelling at him to get that big ice out of the neighborhood. In Sioux Falls right now, there's a guy that built a house. You guys heard that on the news. There's a he. There's this neighborhood by some park. I don't even know much about it. But, but he built this massive house there that blocked all the sun from his neighbors. And, and it's an eyesore. And the judge just told me I had to tear his house down. Oh, no. Can you imagine Noah building this big honking boat in the middle of the neighborhood? And what the neighbors would say about that? What would you say? They're probably saying, get that ice out of the neighborhood. What are you going to do with a boat anyway? You don't need a boat? Animals? Huh. They're going to walk right up to the boat. <laughs> and they're not going to kill each other either. It just didn't make sense. It had never happened before. But Noah stepped out in obedience and saved all of mankind because he trusted God. He didn't understand. But he knew that God did. And so he trusted him. So what is it that God's calling you to do? It may not make sense to you. It may even seem scary. What is it? Because if you step out in obedience to what God's calling you to do, he can use you to touch this world to make a difference for the kingdom. You know, one of the things that is hard for us as Americans is we're very intellectual. And so we approach it. That's, that's a good thing, too. It's not a bad thing. But, but we have an intellectual monkey in our back sometimes. And what that intellectual monkey does is that we hear, we sense the Holy Spirit tell us to do something, and we process it through our intellect and understanding. And we say, that doesn't make sense, therefore it must not be God. Or we say, we count, I mean, we're supposed to count the cost, but we, we do it from an intellectual standing. We start saying, well, the neighbors are going to say this about me, and, and this is going to happen here. And, 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 and so what we begin to do is, is we sense the Lord leading us into a direction, and instead of heading off in that direction, we intellectualize it and begin to fight the direction of God. So you guys don't do that. I'm preaching to myself right now. I do it all the time. All the time. I mean, I know what's best for me. Right? But probably wrong. I, I think God knows what's best for me. But if I'll step away from that, if I'll stop trusting in my own understanding and begin to trust in God, if I can trust in Him completely, then what I'm doing is I'm opening myself up to him to be used to touch this world, to touch this region, to touch Yankton, to touch this church, to touch this community, to make a difference. And when I make a difference, I'm effective for the kingdom. 
Amen? God can use you to touch this world if you believe what God says about you instead of how things appear. I'm going to repeat that one because it's really, really, really good. You can read it up here too. So. God can use you to touch this world if you believe what God says about you instead of how things appear. Let me give you an example out of the, the book of Judges, chapter 6. A guy that we all know and love named Gideon. And, and we tell this story a lot of times and we skip this part of it. Okay? Because we talk about Gideon, the mighty man of valor. Woo woo! And, and the conqueror for the, the, the kingdom and, and this amazing guy that, that did all this cool stuff. And, and, but we forget about the beginning of Gideon's life. And that's the part I want to talk to you about for just a minute. Because he was a mighty man of valor. But, but the, the Israelites were being harassed by the Midianites. And, and the Midianites were, were a brutal, brutal uh, people. And they would steal from the Israelites constantly. And, and the Israelite farmers would grow their grain. And the Midianites would, would wait for them. So how you separated grain would, it, it, from, the, from the chaff is you would use the wind. And you'd put buckets down or, ba or baskets down. And you'd take the, the grain that chaff would get and you'd throw it in the air. And when you threw it in the air, the wind would blow and the chaff would blow away. And the grain would fall back down into the basket. And that's how they separated the, the, the chaff from the, the wheat. And, and so... What the Midianites would do is they would wait for them and spy them out. And when they get it all separated out, they'd come rush in and, and get their free grain. And they would steal it from him, already separated from the, from the chap. And that's what they would do. And, and so Gideon was one of the guys that were out doing this. And he was considered himself the least of the least. And he was full of fear of the Midianite army. And so we know he was full of fear because, remember what I just said, you're supposed to take the, the, the wheat and the chaff together and throw it in the air, right? And you're using the wind to separate it. He's so afraid, he's taking it into a wine press, which is way down, there's no wind there. Because it's, because it's, like, it's like throwing it up in a building. And so I don't know how he did it. I, I sometimes imagine how, do you guys imagine stuff in your mind, your picture, you kind of envision it like that? So I can imagine him doing this, where he's picking up his throat and he's going, <laughs> trying to separate it. I mean, it had to be a hard thing. And so, so imagine this. He's, he's separating the grain from the chaff and, and the farmers are, 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 are tossing the grain and the wind's blowing the chaff away and he's trying to do it indoors and there's no wind and, 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 and Gideon hears the following as he's doing that. So this is where he's at. He's hiding from the army. He's trying to blow the chaff away somehow. I don't know how he was doing it. And, and he's right there. And the angel of God comes to him at that exact time. And he says to him, Greetings, mighty man of valor. <laughs> what do you think Gideon's response was? Who are you talking to? <laughs> Here's a guy that's hiding. But see, God didn't see him in his hidden state. God saw him for what he was going to make him to be. He didn't look like a mighty man of power. I'm sure he didn't feel like a mighty man of power. But it's how God saw him. And when Gideon finally agreed with God, he went out and he defeated a quarter million Midianite soldiers with just a few trumpets and a few candles and clay pots. He wasn't anything special. He just decided to agree with God. God had a plan for him. God says, you're going to be a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, okay, here we go. You see, in order to touch this world for Christ, you have to see yourself the way that God sees you. You have to see yourself as a conqueror because God sees you as more than a conqueror. You got to see yourself as empowered to do amazing things because God has empowered you to do amazing things. You got to see yourself as an overcomer because God sees you as an overcomer. So many Christians see themselves as worthless, and it's just false humility that we sometimes put off. We think that we just aren't worthy, and, and we, we put all this on us, and we, and 
We don't see ourselves the way that God sees us. We don't see ourselves as more than conquerors. We see ourselves as wounded soldiers. And we look at the struggles in our lives that we're dealing with instead of what God has called us to do. And we look at the warfare that we go through instead of the conquering king that can get us through the warfare. And we allow the enemy to keep us in a state of defeat because we're walking in hopelessness instead of in faith. But God looks at you and he says this. Greetings, mighty man of valor. Or greetings, mighty woman of valor. You see, that's the way he sees you. You're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. That's how God sees you. Those are shouting words. That's good, Pastor. Say it again. <laughs> Greetings. God has empowered you to be more than a conqueror. God has a plan, and He's fulfilling the plan for your life and the life of this church. God, the, the best in your life, the best in the life of this church, the best in Yankton is yet to come in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's coming. The power of God is on your life, and He wants you to just receive His power to put aside the hopelessness. And begin to walk in the goodness and the power of God. He's calling you today, mighty man. He's calling you, mighty woman. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. He has a plan. And he's going to use you to fulfill his plan. Let's look at a couple of scriptures Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 to 30. This is why He's going to use you. This is for you. This is especially for you that feel hopeless, that feel like you don't have strength, that feel like you don't know what's going on. He says this, He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Even youths will, youths will become weak and tired. Young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Praise God for His promises. I think we're having a, are we having worship here? We're just piano player today. Whoever's coming up, come on up. I want to encourage you today to give God what you have and allow Him to use you. I want to encourage you today to step out in obedience, even when it doesn't make sense to you. And I want to encourage you today to see yourself the way that God sees you. Because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God sees you as a conquering hero. And God has a plan and a purpose for you and He wants to use you. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. Hallelujah. Not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope. And a future. One of my favorite scriptures, Isaiah chapter 58, 11. The Lord will guide you always. That's a promise. Somebody said, that's an awesome promise. The Lord will guide you, not sometimes. The Lord will guide you, not most of the time. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Yes. Psalms 37, 23. 
The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Would you stand with me this morning? God has got a great plan, a great, a great path ahead for you. And I'm not talking about shit. It's a given to me that God's going to do something amazing with this church. What an amazing church. God is going to do amazing things with this church. He's, I mean, you guys are in for an amazing ride with this church. It is awesome. So let's not even talk about the church right now. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about you. God's going to do something amazing in your life. God has an amazing plan for you. You don't have to wait till you grow up. You're not too old. You're not too crazy. You're not too sane. Doesn't matter. God has an amazing plan for you. And you know what he's waiting on? He's waiting for you to say yes. He's waiting for you to say, okay, God. It's kind of like, after he finally beats me over the head enough time to, to, to get down in front, I'm like, okay, God. Don't you wish we could just say, okay, God, up front? Today's your opportunity to say, okay, God, whatever it is, use me. Strengthen me. Empower me. If you're hopeless today, if you're struggling with a, a discouragement, Give it to the Lord today. Say, okay, God. And allow the Lord to just encourage you today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? First thing I'm going to do, and I always want to do this. This is the reason that I that I really have ministry assistance part here. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you gave your life to him a long time ago, but you haven't been living for him. And the Holy Spirit is just convicting you right now, and you know you need to make a change. Today I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to call you up in front of anybody. I'm going to come talk to you. But today is your day. Hallelujah. Today is your day. I just ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. If that's you today, would you lift your hand up in the air so I can see you, so I know I can talk to you? If you just lift your hand in the air, you're going to commit your life to the Lord. Amen. 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 Anybody else today? So for the rest of this year, maybe this message stuck, struck a chord. And today you want to say, okay, God, it's got it. It's time to make a change. And if that's you today and you know that you need to step out, that it's a been a battle, you've been fighting God off, you certainly are. And today you're going to say, okay, that's it, we're going to make a change. Just raise your hand. Today, it's just as a commitment to God. Say, God, yep, I got it. Got it. We're going to do that. Amen. And just raise your hand in the air. We're just going to pray where you're at today. Lots of hands going up. Anybody else today? This isn't for me to be able to just see that, but really, what sometimes what I think we need to do is we, we need to make a physical move a lot of times to be able to make a mental move. And so, what I'm asking you to do right now is to Take a step of faith. That step of, that step of faith is a physical move by your hand going in the air and saying, yep, that's me. God changed me. So let's start the physical, then move into the spiritual. Anybody else? Why don't you raise your hand? Put it down. That's, that's fine. I'm going to pray for you today. I'm going to pray for you today that, that God will do amazing things. See the hands that going all over this place. My hand too. Lord Jesus, 
Father, we lay aside our fear. We lay aside our agendas. We lay aside everything, every obstacle that gets in our way. And today we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God, use us. We surrender ourselves. We surrender our life. Use us. Strengthen us. Father, where there's discouragement, bring joy. Where there's hopelessness, bring faith. Let your Holy Spirit rest on your people right now, God. Empower them. Strengthen them. Impact them, God. Father, for those that raise their hand, giving their lives to you. Father, if you did that, just pray this prayer with me. Just, Father, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I know that I'm in need of a Savior. God, I have strayed from you. But I'm coming back today. Forgive me, God. I need you, Jesus. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. He's an amazing God, isn't he? Aren't you so thankful for our God? I pastored in, I mean, I've said this a hundred times to you guys, more than a hundred, I've been here a hundred times, but um, I pastored in Europe for a long time, and one of the things I always did with my, our congregation is I always sent them out with a blessing. Can I do that with you today? Is that okay? Would you just lift your hands in a receptive mode? So before I speak this blessing over here, I want to I just need to tell you one thing. Don't forget about the special offering that's happening when we leave here in the end. Amen. So I'm not going to bless you that you give to the special offering. <laughs> but as you go out, just remember that. Keep that back here. But I'm going to just speak a blessing over your life today. Just raise your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless you with the promises of God, with our yes and amen. The Holy Spirit make you healthy and strong in your body and in your mind and in your spirit to move in faith and expectancy. May God's angels be with you to protect and keep you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week in Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.